Greetings, everybody. Happy New Year as well. It seems like that happened a really long time ago in like COVID time, but we have not seen this community since December. So I definitely want to say Happy New Year. Um, I'm Kathleen Traphagan and I co-facilitate the impact group, the GFE OST impact group uh, with Rebecca Goldberg. And um, we're really appreciative of you coming on and spending an hour today. We, I think we're gonna have a terrific conversation um, with our friends from the Department of Education. Let's get started by um, please rename yourself with your pronouns and your organization. Um, so everybody can continue to learn who's in our community and um, also introduce yourself in the chat with your name and organization. Um, and I'm gonna just repeat a intro question from a meeting I was just in, which is what is your favorite dessert? Um, not connected to anything we're talking about today, but always a fun thing to think about. Um, so let's start there. Um, and so we have with us today, uh, Chital Shah and Melissa Moritz, and um, they are both with the department, uh, the Federal Department of Education. And um, one of the things that we are really excited about as a community is the possibilities of partnering with the Department of Education to advance mutual goals. And we're super excited about the way that the Department of Education is interested in um, out of school time and youth development and the ways that this field contributes to um, opportunities for young people to reach their potential. So this hour is going to be devoted to getting to know Chital and Melissa and the opportunities sort of, sort of um, envisioning together the opportunities that um, we can identify and work on together to move those mutual agendas forward. So that's what we're doing. Uh, that's the meeting you're in. Thank you for being here. And I am going to turn it over to Chital. Thank you. Hi, good, good afternoon and good morning, I think, to some folks. So nice to see um, familiar faces. Um, I feel like I'm at home right now um, in the OST group. Um, again, my name is Sheetal Shah, and I'm with the Department of Education um, in the Office of the Secretary, serving as a Senior Advisor to Strategic Partnerships. So super thrilled to be here. I think many of you know that OST after school and community schools is really deeply embedded in my work um, and just the way I would like for others to work as well. So thank you, Kathleen and Rebecca for inviting myself and Melissa to this extremely important conversation. And today I'm not gonna talk a lot because I'm actually here to listen. I wanna hear from you all as does Melissa. And I, I quickly wanted to um, go over our uh, secretary's priorities, which I think most of you have probably seen. And I hope that you all see alignment um, in the work that you are seeing happening in the field, as well as the work that you're supporting in the field. Um, and so just quickly, um, and I think, um, Kathleen, you were gonna maybe drop them into the chat as well. Um, and hopefully we can discuss them further in breakout groups um, potentially. So number one, addressing the impact of COVID on students, families, and educators promoting equity and student access to educational resources and opportunities during the school, out of school, summer, weekends, supporting a diverse educator workforce, not just teachers, but paras, as well as principal leadership and CISPs, um, the school instructional support staff, meeting students' social, emotional, and mental health needs, um, increasing post-secondary access, affordability, completion, and post-enrollment success, and last, but certainly not least, is strengthening cross-agency coordination um, and community engagement to advance systemic change, right? So um, hopefully those resonate um, with you and you can see yourselves in them. And my role, so as um, focusing on strategic partnerships is to work with philanthropy as well as private sector to advance these priorities, whether it's through current grant programs, discretionary grant programs, or sort of um, connected to the priorities, but separate initiatives, right? Um, and so I also work with practitioners in the sectors that really impact these priorities. And the goal of our partnerships, whether private, philanthropic, or other um, national organizations, is to advance the secretary's priorities, of course, to support other um, offices within ed to move the sub-priorities that fall into these six, to partner with you all to provide more support in the field that we can't provide, 
through the funding that's allocated through to us through the budgets um, and to help inform discretionary grants that may come about. And so I participate as does Melissa and other staff in stakeholder conversations constantly. I know there was a dearth of that possibly over the last four years or you know, uh, four or five years ago, but we want to make that a regular component of the work we do. We can't just do, as you all know, the work in isolation without actually hearing from the folks doing the work on the ground. And so this is, I hope um, Kathleen and Rebecca that we can join future meetings to listen and learn as other topics arise um, in the work you all are doing. And Kathleen, did you want me to jump into sort of what types of ways that the department and philanthropy can partner? Or do we want to wait for that? I can't, I don't have the uh, agenda. Yes. That's okay. Yes, it would be terrific if you could just do an outline about like what, you know, what, what are some of the possibilities? Sure. Okay. So there's sort of a few big buckets. One way is um, the creation, you're, getting support from you all, not necessarily funding, but for you all to look at the priority, see where the work is happening and develop research and resources for the field um, so they can do the work more deeply and sustainably. Um, helping us identify good practices, right? So when we have those summits or events, what are those places we wanna make sure to lift up that are doing good work and having an impact? Thirdly, Supporting convenings of coalitions, sponsoring summits, site visits. Where should we go and take the secretary or other education staff, career and political, and other folks as a group to listen and learn um, about the good practices? Um, technical assistance. How can you all support technical assistance as it relates to these priorities? Um, and it's already, so if you look at our full service community schools grant program, Right, we have technical assistance that is supporting the grantees that is not coming from the Department of Education, but is still supporting our grant program. Um, communications, lifting up the stories and voices um, thing, in, which you know eventually leads to advocacy, which we can't do, but the field can do. And then just one thing I wanted to underscore is um, in everything that we're doing and I'm not, I'm not making this up, I promise. Every conversation talks about family, student, and community engagement. So undergirding each priority, we need to be able to lift, we want to lift that up, and equity as well. So the, like, those three things are sort of threaded throughout everything that we do. And we are pushing folks in the field, philanthropy especially, I am, <laughs> to make sure that everything we look at um, has those components. Um, I will stop to take a breath. Um, I don't know, Kathleen, if we want questions, but I'd, I'd rather, I'd love for Melissa to introduce herself because Melissa is my partner in crime and thought partner around, especially around the OST and workforce. She brings so much experience and knowledge. I just got here two months ago, but Melissa knows the ins and outs way better than I do. Melissa? Awesome, thank you so much. And it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, I serve as an after school and summer learning fellow actually in, in the Institute of Education Sciences, IES. Um, and it's so great to be back with, with this group. Um, IES is the independent research arm of the US Department of Education. And I sort of split my time between directly supporting IES as well as supporting the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education where we see a lot of the out of school time grant programs and activities taking place. Um, uh, one thing I just you know wanted to lift up and, and underscore. So it, thank you so much for going through all of the, the secretary's priorities. Um, in addition, you know as we're working on the American Rescue Plan implementation, um, IES was given $100 million in the American Rescue Plan to make sure to really learn from efforts around recovery. So what's working in terms of learning acceleration, um, how do we support students' um, socio-emotional and academic needs, um, mental health, et cetera. And so we are taking a lot of different activities um, around that, including some research activities, including um, some prizes and challenges. And while I had 
had you all, I wanted to make sure to share one open opportunity for engagement with IES, um, which is an example um, of what Sheetal talked about um, in terms of stakeholder engagement. We have an open request for information right now. IES is planning to launch a couple of challenges um, in early 2022, and we have an open request for information for any interventions or program providers or others who are doing work to um, accelerate academic achievement in the realm of middle school science, particularly for the lowest performing quartile of students nationwide, as well as um, within the realm of upper elementary math, particularly for students with disabilities. So I'll pop that link into the chat, but we would really welcome, I'm sure so many folks on this call either are representing programs that are doing great work in that area or are supporting programs doing great work in that area. Um, out of school time programs are absolutely welcome um, and encouraged uh, virtual blended in person hybrid like all contexts all formats and settings so I just wanted to take advantage of, of this to make sure that to give an example of one of the ways that we are looking for continued stakeholder engagement um, within IES as well as the broader department. And one thing, um, and Kathleen, I don't know if you were just going to jump on. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, I just, go ahead. Um, and Melissa, thank you for lifting that up. And I also, one of the objectives for myself and Melissa today is also to hear about um, the, what you're seeing in terms of OST and ARP SR implementation. Um, what is, um, uh, what are some good examples? Also, what are the challenges that you're seeing? Um, you know, part of our role is yes, to use the bully pulpit and lift up the good examples, but also to um, guide people on potentially, you know, these are the good ways to use your ARP funding for OST. And I suspect it's not that easy um, for CBOs um, and, so anyways, it just, you know, what would be helpful, whether at the state or district level um, for us to put out there or signal, even in our messaging, right? So it could be as simple as the messaging. So, and I don't, I know Kathleen that that's part of a breakout group, but I just wanted to lift that up. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm just going to throw that in the chat about what we're going to be doing um, for part of the time today is that we're going to just split up into two and you will be able to choose which uh, conversation you want to be in and we'll do one that's focused on um, ARP and ESSER implementation and sustainability and the other on uh, workforce and both of those will be, you know, overall frame is out of school time um, and youth development. So we're going to do that in a couple of minutes. I, um, but let's do just a, a couple of things first. One is, um, Melissa, can you just, I, I don't, I wonder if I'm putting you on the spot here, but I would love for you to just um, briefly explain the um, fellows program because sure. I think that people might not have an idea and that's also just a terrific way for philanthropy yeah. to, to like collaborate with, you know, um, and what you were saying the other day, like, you know, um, staff is policy. Did you say that? Person personnel yeah. is and, policy. I yeah, stole yeah. that. Like, so I don't quote me for much. that. But yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, tell people about that. Um, and then I have a couple more questions. Of course. Um, yeah, so so as I mentioned, I serve as a fellow. So I'm on loan from the STEM Next Opportunity Fund, a nonprofit organization. And I'm a full-time employee of IES. Um, there are uh, two foundations that have provided a grant to the STEM Next Opportunity Fund that enable me to, you know, pay my salary and benefits and all that good stuff to be on loan with the department. There's an MOU between IES and the STEM Next Opportunity Fund um, and fellowships of, of this kind. There are lots and lots of varied fellowship programs of this kind, um, but it is a, a really great opportunity to provide um, staff and capacity at such a critical moment in time. Uh, I started last April, or yeah, April, um, right as the American Rescue Plan was being passed and three months into a new administration. And as many of you probably have seen, um, staffing has been has been hard and slow um, for a number of reasons. And in the previous administration, offices were at sort of a pretty bare minimum, at least at ed, um, in order. And so there's a real big need for um, for capacity and, and subject matter expertise on various topics. 
Um, so, you know, that this is a, a great opportunity for individuals to be able to serve. This is my second time at Ed. I was also a political appointee under the Obama administration. So it's been fun to, to come back to the group. Um, and, you know, I just, especially as agencies have more resources than they've ever had historically, it takes a while for the staffing, like authorities and things to be able to ramp up to be able to support those needs. So STEM Next, anyway, in terms of the Opportunity Fellows Program that I'm a part of, we currently have four fellows. Two of us are serving at Ed. One is in the 21st century um, program office at the department, and then I am um, in IES. We also have a fellow who is placed at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and a fellow who's placed at the Department of Labor. Um, the STEM Next fellows are all focused on informal education. Um, I am explicitly focused on out of school time broadly. Patty Curtis, who's in the 21st century office, is focused on STEM and uh, informal STEM. Um, and then our fellows at, at OSTP as well as Department of Labor are again focused at that intersection of, of STEM and out of school time. Uh, so again, a really great opportunity and happy to share more about the program if, if it's helpful, but it has been really, uh, I mean, an incredible vehicle to be able to come back to the department and provide support in whatever way, shape or form they need me to do so. I think you're muted, Kathy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um that's terrific. And I, I guess I'd also just want to point out that, um, well, you have, uh, and with STEM Next Opportunity Fund, an aspiration to get to 10 fellows in, in all, right? And are, um, and running this as a pooled fund through STEM Next Opportunity Fund. So any of the funders on the call that find this interesting and have, um, you know, some, some flexibility within your own funding portfolio to consider um, being a part of this, I think maybe Melissa, you can drop in the chat, like speak to you or Ron or whoever. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that this would be this is really a terrific opportunity for the for the field to um, uh, take advantage as much as we can, really at scale. If we could get you know ten fellows across um, different agencies that are focused on on out of school time and. Um, is it is it it's not exclusively STEM though, right? It it although it, it all is basically what what it is the funders are and, and you all are deciding what it will be as you build. Yeah. Yeah, so um, okay. right. So my role is focused on out of school time broadly. Obviously, there's some pieces of STEM that fall in that because there's amazing STEM programs in out of school time. Um, and the opportunities I shared, you know, uh, we IES identified some real uh, gaps in their own portfolio around some STEM programs. So that's the, where these challenges are emerging from. Um, but my role is very broadly focused on out of school time work. Um, so yeah, it can, and and also because I'm a full-time employee of, of the department, the, my supervisor at Ed really determined, you know, with STEM Next where they needed support. Um, so it, it really is a, you know, you kind of craft it with the, uh, with STEM Next and the office that you'll be supporting as well as the funders, so. Okay, great. So um, so that will be dropped in the chat and anybody who wants to, to follow up on that, please do so and we'll, We'll continue. I think we'll, you know, hope to have other fellows on these calls, and we'll continue to collaborate and highlight um, with that. So, um, okay. So, one thing we're going to do um, first of all, if you have any questions so far for Melissa or Sheetal, please put them in the chat now, um, and we could spend a couple of minutes answering those questions. Um, at the same time, we do that. I'm just going to outline what we're going to do in the small groups. Um, we're really looking for conversations that dive into these two subjects. So just choose which subject you'd like um, and join that group. And we've got a Jamboard set up where, so um, because we have a lot of folks, so small group is actually not even true um, at this point, but we're, we just wanna do two. So we'll have opportunities for you to write your ideas on the Jamboard and then also speak. Um, and we're looking for ways that um, you can think right now about, um, collaboration and partnership with the department. And I put in the chat, you know, kind of what I was hearing Sheetal talk about, um, in, about what it is that people can do. Um, so think about that and we'll put that up. I'll put that also up in the, in the small group and, um, and Rebecca who's gonna facilitate the other small group can put that up in hers too. Um, okay, so questions right now. Did anybody have any? I see. Kathy Stevens, you put something in here, which is super interesting. Are you here? Can you come on? Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Can we spotlight Kathy? 
Oh, yeah, I'm not on camera. I'm oh, you're not on camera. Okay, good. <laughs> Just go then. No That's problem. okay. Yeah. Not at I all. Have, we have snow and two kids on e-learning. So no, it was a little not at all. Great. Just sorry, sorry to call you out. Let's go. Uh, no, I did want to share. It's, it's not exactly um, what we were talking about, but we are pretty excited in South Carolina because we were able to partner with the State Department of Ed to um, access ESSER funds for the next three years to start a leadership program for after school and summer learning. And it's called SCALE, South Carolina After School Leaders Empowered. And um, we are launching quickly because we wanna have three cohorts by the time the funding needs to be spent. So we've just had this huge interest in the, we have 84 school districts in the state. And in our first class, we'll have something like 37 represented, lots of school district voices. Uh, and community program voices and faith-based. And so um, anyway, we're just really excited. The first gathering is gonna be in the third week of February. Kathy, I wanted to share because I think it could be uh, widely replicable in other states that haven't spent all their money. Um, we have a proposal and a budget and all sorts of information we'd be happy to share with anybody. Yeah. Kathy, do you mind sharing? That would be great if you could. I'll drop my email in the chat. Sure, um, no, not examples at all. like to. this are super important. Yeah, I'd be glad to share. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. That sounds so exciting, and we definitely want to know more about that. Sure, great. I'll share. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not really seeing other questions right now, which is fine because we're going to go into the small groups. And if you do have questions, um, everybody's you know going to put their contact information in, and we'll have a little bit of a wrap up time um, at the end. But right now, we're going to go into small groups and um, come back probably around like ten of, so we can just do a little sense making before we let you go. So, um, Jesse, are you are you all organized? Yep. You there. You always are. There's one new okay. question in the chat. Maybe just. Uh, if Sheetal or Melissa want to respond to Lakshmi. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, please. So she's Lakshmi. interested in thoughts on LEAs using their ESSER funds to create their own after school programs compared to partnering with community based providers. Curious what you're seeing from the department and any language you're using to encourage or you know support partnerships. Um, I will take a crack at it, Melissa, because I don't have much to say on it. <laughs> um, I haven't seen any um, sort of explicit examples one way, or not explicit. I, I, my thoughts are that they should partner with CBOs and that's what we should be advocating for and pushing. Um, I don't know, um, Lakshmi, if uh, how the district or school is staffing it. You know, are they using educators and paras and others or are they and not pulling in community-based organizations and so what does the after school program look like i mean is it what so i just not knowing the details um but my sort of knee-jerk reaction is no you should be partnering with community-based organizations to offer a continued experience beyond what is already happening in the school day yeah so, and uh, yeah building on that um i think the um we have tried to encourage that at every turn both through the faq documents that we've put out um around and and as well as some of the handbooks tried to encourage people to partner where they can we don't have a formal mechanism to require that they partner and so we know that this is still a challenge where you know it's in some cases easier right to just have the money flow through so we I've, I've heard this in a lot of different spaces and we continue to think about additional ways that we can encourage as much as possible and lift up those strong examples um, i will say that particularly in the realm of the technical assistance work that we have underway at ed um, we have been able to strongly encourage that people form teams where they are bringing their 21st century state coordinator in addition to someone from the state department of education in addition to their statewide after school network, in addition to at least one community based organization. And so we are utilizing our technical assistance work. Um, and we said so that there's two pieces to the technical assistance work one which I know many of you participated in last summer 
when Ed launched the Summer Learning and Enrichment Collaborative, and we tried to both showcase at the federal level how we were establishing partnerships by bringing together a group of partners and then also hold up strong examples of school community partnerships wherever possible and in every, you know, um, plenary, etc. And many of the examples that you all helped to lift up were extremely critical. Um, Lakshmi, I know you were one of our, our featured speakers, um, so it was very helpful to have you and your expertise on the call. Um, and and we continue to hear that that is an ongoing big challenge, that if, that if the money flows directly to LEAs, LEAs are going to utilize it for summer school, not necessarily summer learning and enrichment, and the incentive to, incentive to partner is not always there. That said, we have seen some states work directly with their statewide after school network, directly with community based organizations, and so we are trying to, again, lift up all of those examples and encourage partnership where possible. It has really helped to inform, you know, as well as pull in 21st century, because we we know that's a strong example of funds going directly to community-based organizations, faith-based or faith organizations and others. Um, so that's what I have on that one. That's a continued problem. We are always open to additional solutions and examples. Um, and I do think it's just like really important learning for all of us that it, when the money flows directly to the district, there has to be additional incentives to partner. Um, so it helps to inform future efforts too. But that's also potentially a way where we could all work together. If there were additional incentives to partner, you might see districts do it more. If there was more sort of, you know, we're trying to tackle the technical assistance piece, which is also critical, because even if districts and LEAs have the, even if LEAs have the um, desire to partner, they don't always know how. Um, and so being able to model those examples and be able to pull MOUs, data sharing agreements, those kinds of things together, um, I think are, are helpful. Um, and this is a place I also think where we have a lot to, you know, there's a lot to learn from, from each other, as well as the community schools work and, and others that have figured out successful school community partnerships. Thanks, Melissa. So this is a great conversation. We're going to carry forward into the breakout group. So as Kathleen mentioned, we're going to have two topics you choose from. One around ARPA, uh, ESSER implementation sustainability. So if you want to continue that conversation, join that breakout group. I know Sheetha will be with us there. And then the second conversation is around the workforce challenges and solutions. Melissa is going to join that group. So I want to say we know we've been uh, talking about workforce challenges over the fall, in many different settings and um, different angles. So um, this is a little bit different that we're trying to lift this up for the department in, in terms of, you know, what are ways the department could support those workforce challenges and solutions. So we don't want to rehash things that you've already told us, but we'll have lots of ways to capture those notes in the Jamboard and look forward to what you bring into the conversation, knowing who's listening. Um, so Jesse, uh, as soon as you're ready, if you could launch those breakout groups, um, we'll go there and then come back after about 20 minutes. Um, and and then we'll have Sheetal and, and uh, Melissa react a little bit to what was heard and, and then wrap up about what's coming next. Um, wonderful. So I'm sure both groups had lots of ideas generated and um, we'll still be adding into the to the Jamboard. Um, what I shared in our group is that we want to we want that Jamboard to continue to generate ideas. So if you could continue to add in um, specific, spe specifically solutions that you're seeing that you'd like to lift up for the department. Um, and feel free to share that with your colleagues if um, you think they have ideas to add in there as well. We have a couple minutes for um, Sheetal and Melissa to maybe just share any initial reactions to, to challenges and ideas that they've heard. Um, Maybe Sheetal, do you want to start us yeah, off? I'll, I'll be really quick. Thank you, um, Rebecca and Kathleen. Um, so some of the challenges I heard, and unfortunately, these aren't surprising. I wish they were, because then that would mean other people aren't having these challenges, um, is really where the money is flowing, right? And who has access and, you know, frankly, who who is being given the power to access it as well. And um, so that is one of the challenges I heard um, communications and messaging. And then in our group also really um, access to the but access and as well as the sustainability. So how are we going to be able to support the field in sustaining beyond the three years. And one of my takeaways um, that I'm, you know, leaving with is uh, how can we from Ed really push on the messaging around, you know, encouraging LEAs to intentionally partner with their CBOs who have already been working with the schools 
and see the ARP funding as you know, not just a stopgap, but really use, utilizing the ARP funding to support more, more and deeper community partnerships, but also thinking with the community around the sustainability piece. So, I mean, that is one of the biggest roles we can play is the messaging and bully pulpit, right? And so I appreciate you guys sort of um, leaning in on that because I, I think that that is something um, we are hearing and um, if we, the more we can push out the better through all of our programming, right? Um, whether it is through this community schools or whether it's through any of the ARP academic um, acceleration work that we do. So I'm also, sorry, quickly looking through my notes. Um, and I know one thing we didn't get to in our group in terms of discussion, but folks are putting stuff in is what are the solutions, right? Um, that we can, can lift up. And that's another, so bully pulpit and also us lifting up those good practices um, that are having an impact in the field. So please, um, I know sometimes we leave a jam board after the meeting, but if you can spend a few minutes after today's meeting to drop some stuff in, it will be extremely helpful to both Melissa and I. So thank you, Melissa. Of course, and and the more specific, the better, um, because we can. Um, you know, it's very helpful to know, like particular districts, schools, programs, locations. All of that is very helpful. Um, I really appreciate the conversation we were having in the workforce group. And again, similarly, a lot of the challenges that we heard are challenges that we hear pretty consistently around um, staff looking for more hours, staff's fear of COVID exposure, challenges in terms of figuring out how to implement the vaccine requirements or not requirements, additional support needed around professional learning, um, salary benefits. So I, I felt like we were able to get clear there. And what I I really appreciated in the conversation was um, I, I heard loud and clear that it is really important for us messaging wise to continue to lift up the importance of partnership, as well as to provide real supports around how you actually do that um, and enable like enable that. In addition, you know, as I was searching through some of the non-regulatory guidance documents that the department has put out, there have been a couple of frequently asked questions that kind of get at this um, to be able to encourage and make sure that people know that ARP funds in particular can be used for partnership with community-based organizations between the overall FAQ and then the FAQ on community schools. But I heard folks say that like, that can, we need to be clear, concise, and very targeted to the particular audience. So I appreciated that that feedback as well. Um, and we did surface some some very particular uh, and some effective practices that are emerging across the board. Um, some districts, you know, are really are working um, sort of holistically with their out of school time providers. There's some really great pathways work that's happening for out of school time professionals into teacher preparation programs um, that folks were setting up and 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 a, a handful of others. Um, I also did hear that the the multiple requirements that out of school time programs are asked to fulfill given the multiple sources of funds from different agencies can be very challenging. There's no like common app for out of school time providers to be able to both access HHS funds and ed funds and DOJ funds and other things. So I did hear that that complexity is obviously well intentioned because each of those agencies have slightly different mandates and therefore different requirements and processes, but can also really result in a lot of additional uh, barriers that maybe don't even exist for school districts and so prevent some of the flexibility of out of school time providers. So all very helpful, all things um, Sheetal and I will talk more about and figure out um, what we might be able to do to support. But again, uh, please do continue to drop in as specific as possible um, solutions, bright spots, examples, um, so that we can continue to follow along there. And then we did have in the Jamboard a few slides, a few things later, like your overall vision for different um, things and all of that is always helpful to know as well if, if you all have time. But I know you're some of the most busy people out there. So um, this time was great. I'm very grateful for it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us, Sheetal and Melissa. As everyone, you, you can hear very clearly, they have open ears to the field to um, know what to lift up, how to support uh, practitioners, and, and um, the willingness means a lot, I think. So um, they've provided their direct emails. Um, so, you know, 
use that, bring ideas to them. Um, I think it's an open invitation. They'll also be joining us at an upcoming funder meetup. So we'll be talking more specifically around uh, philanthropy and department partnerships. Um, to close us out, I want to share an update from last month's call in December. We shared around the Power of Us workforce survey that American Institutes for Research is launching. That, uh, that survey will launch on February 22nd. 2022 at 2 p.m. Eastern with a launch webinar. I put the, the um, link in the chat for you to uh, sign up for the webinar. Please share that with all of your colleagues um, as much as you can. The idea is to get this out there and to get as many folks working in the field as possible to participate in the survey. We'll continue to share updates on that um, in future conversations. And next month's um, monthly stakeholder call, we're going to be diving into youth mental health um, issues, challenges, and solutions. So look out for more information on that. That'll be February 18th, I believe, the third Friday. If you were registered for today, you are registered for that one. Um, and just want to give a big thank you again to our speakers, um, and we appreciate everyone joining us today.